Our respected physicians, welcome you all to today's very special webinar on pediatric rheumatology. We are very lucky that we have some a very prominent figure of pediatrics and pediatric rheumatology from the subcontinent. We have with us two wonderful speakers from India. Uh, let me introduce them. Our first speaker, Professor T. Satish Kumar. He's working as professor of pediatrics and consultant and pediatric yeah. rheumatologist, Christian Medical yeah. College. Hello. Yeah. We have with us as a speaker, uh, Professor Suma Balan, professor and consultant, pediatric rheumatologist, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi, India. And we are very, very honored and lucky that we have two chairperson from this two great country from Bangladesh in India. Our chairperson is living legend of pediatrics from Bangladesh, Professor Nazmun Nahar, ex-head department of pediatrics, Dhaka Medical College and Ibrahim Medical College, ex-director general Bardem and ex-president Bangladesh College of Physicians and Surgeons. And we have with us uh, Professor Surjit Singh as chairperson. He is one of the world authority of Kawasaki disease and a master of his subject. Professor Surjit Singh, head department of pediatrics and chief and chief allergy immunology unit, advanced pediatric center, postgraduate institute of medical education and research, Chandigarh, India. And this session is organized by PD physicians. I like to invite Professor Surjit Singh, sir, to uh, introduce our speakers and the session. Over to Professor Surjit Singh, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan. So I, I welcome all the participants to this very special webinar being organized by uh, Bangladesh physicians. And uh, I, on behalf of my co-chair, Professor Nazmo Nahar, uh, welcome the two uh, very distinguished speakers that we have, very distinguished and very experienced speakers that we have. The first speaker would be uh, Professor Satish Kumar, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and consultant pediatric rheumatologist at the Christian Medical College, Velour. He runs a very busy uh, pediatric rheumatology service and uh, runs uh, uh, an outstanding uh, service um, in, in pediatric rheumatology. In fact, he started this service uh, in pediatric rheumatology when he took over uh, from uh, Dr. Danda uh, several years ago. Dr. Satish has been trained um, in Canada and we are very lucky to have him speak uh, for us today. And he will be talking on a pediatric rheumatologist's perspective on fever. This is a very common problem in pediatric rheumatology. And I don't think we can have, uh, we can have a better speaker and a more experienced speaker than Dr. Satish. Dr. Satish, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sujit Singh. I'm going to just share my slides and uh... Is it in a PowerPoint? It's in a <coughs> full screen mode, no, sir? Yeah, it's visible. It's visible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, um, Dr. Sujit Singh, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you, the uh, physicians of Bangladesh, for inviting us for this wonderful webinar. And I also want a special thanks to my teacher, Dr. Dabashis Danda, for including me in this webinar. So in the next half an hour, what I am going to talk to you is causes of pyrexia of unknown origin in children. And what are the clues when a child presents with fever, you think of a rheumatological cause. And I also will take you through four interesting uh, case scenarios, which we have managed when the children presenting with PO. Okay, we'll start with what William Osler said. He said, humanity has but three great enemies. One is fever, one is famine, and is a war. Of these, by far and the greatest, by the far the most terrible is the fever. You can see in this picture, uh, Dr. Osler is taking a class for a medical student. In the blackboard, if you look into, it talks about 
infections like TB and the typhoid. This is an image, one of the images from the John Opens uh, archives. So you know that any child who comes to with fever is really a pediatrician's nightmare. Wherever the child gets presented initially, they will think of their own diagnosis. If we go to infectious disease specialist, he will think of all the infectious causes possible in the world. If he goes to hematology, he will think of malignancy. So who has to see as a child as a whole and make a diagnosis is a pediatrician. Who has to see the child as a whole, not as a specialist view, who can see the thing and decide what this child's fever could be. Fever is not a diagnosis. Fever is a symptom of a particular disease. So what is the disease the child has got? So when you look into the fever, okay, anybody mild, like one, two days, three days fever, everybody can manage, mostly viral fever, common infections. But if you look into the definition of pyrexia of unknown origin, this is the definition from 1961. Febrile illness lasted for more than three weeks with a fever of more than 38.3 degrees Celsius or 101 degree Fahrenheit on several occasions. But remember, we have come a long way through from 1961. So nowadays, the latest up to date says the pyrexia of unknown origin is a fever more than 101 degree Fahrenheit, at least eight days of duration, in whom the diagnosis is not apparent after initial either OP management or hospital evaluation that includes clinical, physical, and laboratory assessment. So within eight days, if the fever is going beyond eight days, and if you're not able to make a diagnosis, this is called pyrexia of unknown origin. So when you look into the Causes of pediatric fever of unknown origin, the causes are huge. We talked from infectious, the broadly divide them into infectious and non-infectious causes. So infectious causes, again, could be bacteria, virus, and other fungal infections. And non-infectious causes could be due to oncology, autoimmune diseases, and other uh, miscellaneous or hereditary uh, causes for fever in children. So this is a recent systematic review. What they found out is they looked into various uh, literature uh, articles who looked into the PEO. So they found out the commonest cause for PEO in children is infection, is about 30 to 50 percent, followed by inflammatory diseases, then followed by malignancy and some heritable or miscellaneous conditions also can present with fever. So, first thing, as a physician, as a pediatrician, as a pediatric rheumatologist, what are the clues which we can see from an, it could be due to a non-infectious cause. Suppose the duration of fever increases, the likelihood of infectious cause decreases. Somebody has got fever for one and a half years or six months, seven months, again, the, the chance of infection goes down. And well in between episodes of fever, that is very, very important. If somebody has got an infection or malignancy, they'll be sick with fever all the time. But if it is a rheumatological condition, the child may be appear well in between the episodes of fever. No history of contact, mainly somebody has got contact with TB, you think of TB, brucella, typhoid, all the history of contact. Family history of similar illness, because for the younger child has got TB, the other child can have uh, illness. Other specific features, suppose a child with prolonged fever has got classical features of SLE, you should think of lupus. So these are the clues towards non-infectious cause. When you look, come into the history, so this is what, as a physician, we all take history for any child who comes with fever. We ask about, without any focus, we ask about general, we ask about the general examination, we ask about each and every system. I'll, so the underlying ones are the important things which gives a clue towards a rheumatological disorder. The energy level and fatigue, which is very, very important in children, with autoimmune disease, especially lupus, their energy level will be low. They always say they feel fatigue. In, if you take into the other symptoms, redness, pain, especially in the eye, very, very important. Nasal ulcers, oral ulcers, again, favors towards rheumatological condition. In the cardiovascular system, you look for the Renard's phenomenon. Some child says, my hands turns blue, along with prolonged fever. You think of rheumatological condition. Respiratory symptoms, nothing very specific because all of them can have respiratory symptoms. Again, in the GI symptoms, blood in stools, melina, very, very important, especially when they have like inflammatory bubble disease. 
skin is a very important thing in pediatric rheumatology. So if you look into a rash, especially this particular type of rash, petechiae, purpura, ulcers, especially genital and perineal ulcers, photosensitivity, alopecia, hair changes, nail changes, and nail fold capillary changes, I'll come into that later. You think of rheumatological condition. And somebody comes with joint pain, and especially if they have morning stiffness or gelling, which is favors towards rheumatological condition. All the others are not very specific for a rheumatological condition, but a rheumatological condition can involve any system in the body. Again, in examination-wise, you look for specifically for conjunctival injection or hemorrhage, which can give a clue towards the rheumatological conditions. And skin, mainly petechiae, purpura, nodules, ulcers, alopecia, and hair abnormalities will give a clue towards rheumatological diagnosis than other conditions. I'll show you examples for each and everything. So if you look, what are the common rheumatological conditions presenting as a pyrexia of unknown object? So these are the five main things which can present with fever in a child, especially with prolonged fever, lupus, systemic JA, dermatomyositis, vasculitis, and periodic fever syndromes, which are coming up nowadays. So I will take you to each and every one. Then when you come back to the case scenarios, we'll try to apply the same analogy, what we are going to discuss. So when will you suspect systemic onset JA? Because it's a very big mimicker of infection and malignancy. So if a child is unwell during the episodes of fever, so first in the rounds you saw the child, at the early, the early morning, the child has got so sick, there is a rash, the fever was very high grade. But the same child, when you see after some time when the child is here for bread, the child looks absolutely well. There is no fever, no rash. And they say this typical fever we see in systemic onset JA, is every day, once a day or twice a day spike, especially on the particular time of the day. And this is a classical salmon rash, which comes along with the fever. Whenever the child has febrile, the rash comes. When the fever settles, the rash goes away. So we always tell the patients to take a photograph of the rash or the junior doctor to go and see the child when the child was febrile, whether the child has got rash. And they can have polyarthritis of large and small joints, which is very common. They can also have serocytes, presenting like a pericardial effusion, and they can have hepatospinum metallic. So it's a big mimicker. So it's remember that it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Second is lupus. I think lupus is very easy to diagnose when they present. You all know that lupus affects any part of the body, starting from neurological, skin, heart, lungs, kidney, GI, blood, arthritis. So when a child with presents like this, classical alopecia, hyperpigmentation, oral ulcers, it's very easy to diagnose SLE. This is a classical malar rash we see in children with lupus. And this is a alopecia, diffuse alopecia we see in a child with lupus. Typical oral ulcers, non-painful oral ulcers, especially on the heart palate is very, very significant. So clinical clues, the adolescent girl who comes with prolonged fever, fatigue, Malar rash, oral ulcers, hair loss, epistaxis, bleeding manifestation, secondary amenorrhea, very, very important, especially not only in lupus, in any autoimmune disease, especially in the adolescent girl, the secondary amenorrhea is very, very important clue towards rheumatological condition. Dermatomyositis, again, is very easy because they have the classical rash, which we call as heliotrope rash. You can see on the upper eyelid, you can see the telangiectasia on the upper eyelid. This is a child I saw two weeks ago with the dermatomyositis. We can see this typical heliotrope rash. You can also see that malar rash. And typical Gautron spapules, you can see on the metacopophalangeal joints. This is a Gautron sign, which we see on the knees and elbows. And this is a classical V sign, wherever the sun exposed areas. And if you have a nail fold capillaroscopy, you can see the nail fold capillary changes in a child with dermatomyositis. Vasculitis, again, Vasculitis, you can have skin nodules. This is a recently we had a child last week with cutaneous pan. You can see the nodules. This is a child again with cutaneous pan. Cutaneous pan can present with skin lesions like this, purpura fulminans like lesions. They can present with non healing ulcers and they also can present with gangrene. So, remember that if you see this type of lesions with a child with fever, you should suspect medium muscle vasculitis, which can present like this. 
and this is a very classical example of small vessel vasculitis, especially common in henoxal and purpura when somebody has got fever and this type of rash, straight away our diagnosis should be henoxal and purpura. Okay, so I, I told you about four diseases which can present like pyrexia of unknown origin in children. I talked about systemic JA, I talked about lupus, I talked about dermatomyositis, I talked about vasculitis. So I'm going to take you through four interesting cases which we had all presented like a prolonged fever. So this is a two years old girl from Kavya from nearby state Pondicherry. So she presented the fever for seven days, irritability and macular rash from day three of illness. When we examine this child is febrile, she has got a macular rash over the body. She has got cervical lymph nodes 2.5 to 2 centimeters and the liver was palpable four centimeters below the right costal margin. So she was admitted in the ward. Investigation showed high white cell count with thrombocytosis, with race, ESR, and CRP. This child's urine was normal, creat was normal because the fever was there for seven days. Vidal wheel flicks was negative. Blood culture was sent. This is what routinely we do in our institute. Anybody with prolonged fever more than five days, we start them on cefetoxime and doxycycline. Cefetoxime is to cover enteric fever. Doxycycline is to cover the rickett cell infection which is common, very common in our area. So what are the rheumatological diseases do you think for this child and what investigation you order? So if you look into this, so whether it fits into systemic JA, whether it fits into SLE, Kawasaki disease, vasculitis, or it belongs to periodic fever syndrome. So as a part of this, I think it looks like a Kawasaki disease. The investigation you order is a echo for anybody when you suspect Kawasaki disease. It's a clinical diagnosis, echo has to be done. So for, di for diagnosing Kawasaki disease, we have a diagnostic criteria. So this is your classical non prudent conjunctivitis. This is a cervical lymph node, either unilateral or bilateral, more than, than 1.5 centimeters. These are the oral changes, which can be erythema of the lips and the strawberry tongue, faint rash, any type of rash can be seen in KD. And this is a classical peripheral edema, which you can see in the children with Kawasaki disease. And remember that peeling, don't wait for the peeling to diagnose Kawasaki disease because peeling comes in the subacute phase, which is after 10 days of the illness. So we have to treat these children before that. So this is the definition from American Heart Association, which I showed. Fever should be more than five days. with the four or at least five clinical criteria, which I showed already. And remember that all these features do not occur at the same time. You, when you see the child on the fourth day, fifth day, the eye changes may have gone. So you have to go back to the history. Don't wait. Uh, no, you have to see all this five. And there is an incomplete form of KD where you have less than four clinical features. If that, that is there, we have to go by ESR CRP with echocardiogram and three out of the other six parameters. This is very, very important because in children with infants, especially children around six months, seven months, they don't present with complete Kawasaki disease. They most of the time they present with incomplete Kawasaki disease. So what happened to this child? We did an echo and echo you can see here, you can see the Z score is 10.7 in the left anterior descending artery and left main coronary and the right main coronary were normal. You can see they reported as aneurysms. So this is a new thing in Kawasaki disease. We don't go by the size of the coronary arteries anymore. Nowadays we have a normative data like we check your height and weight. We have a normative data we go by the Z score. Z score, anything more than two is abnormal. Two to 2.5 has got small aneurysm. 2.5 to five is called medium aneurysm. Five to 10 is called large aneurysm. So we have to classify them according to the Z scores. So this child fits into the clinical criteria because this child has got fever, this child has got rash, this child has got lymphadenopathy. But remember this child fits into incomplete Kawasaki disease because this child doesn't fulfill four out of five. So we gave IVAG and aspirin. Aspirin dose nowadays is 30 to 50 milligram. No point in giving very high dose aspirin. So what happened? We gave IVAG two grams, but the fever persisted after 48 hours of giving IVAG. So this is something called resistant Kawasaki disease. So if anybody has got persistence of fever after 36 hours of IVAG, we should call them as resistant KD. So what are the options available for resistant KD? According to American Heart Association, we can give second dose of IVAG. You can give methylprednisolone or you can give infliximab. So what did we do for this child? 
So this child was given five milligram per kilogram of infliximab. That's what we follow in our unit. So after that child became afebrile. So this child is followed in our OPD with regular serial monitoring of echoes and child is on aspirin. So this is a nice review article from Surjit Singh sir on October 2019. So if you look into that, so Kawasaki disease can present in unusual ways also. So KD in infants is very, very important because it is often incomplete. They present only fever and don't think incomplete KD means mild KD. Incomplete KD are the thing which has got very high risk of coronary artery aneurysms. They can also delay the presentation because of the incompleteness. And they also can present something like KD shock syndrome and myocarditis, especially during this time of COVID. We have a lot of children presenting like this with the MISC. And they also atypical KD when they have neurological involvement, renal involvement, ophthalmological involvement, musculoskeletal involvement, GI, pulmonary. So they can present in other various ways also. So what is the learning point this condition uh, from this child? Think of rheumatological condition when you think all our investigations are preliminary, Vidal, wheel Felix, dengue, the common tropical infections are negative and there is no improvement with antibiotics. High platelet count, always think of a rheumatological condition. Don't give steroids for anybody without having a proper diagnosis. Wait for the child for the disease to evolve, then you treat and with steroids if it is indicated. So we'll come to the second child. So this is a 10 years old girl. She presented fever for 20 days. She was referred from one of the uh, corporate hospitals from Coimbatore. History wise, apart from the 10 years and 20 days of fever, there is nothing there suggestive of rheumatic disease, uh, oral ulcers, malar rash, alopecia. And she was already extensively evaluated because she's 20 days. She was treated with asapriaxone, amice, amikacin, and doxycycline was given for her. And anti-malarials anti also were given. She also had a similar episode of fever one month ago, but settled within with some oral medications. No family of autoimmune disease. She attained menarche with regular cycles. So they have done a, something called ANA profile, which is done very routinely in the commercial labs. The ANA was negative, but SM was positive. So they referred to us saying that well, for further evaluation, is it really SLE or what do you think? This is what the child was referred to us. And before going to what you, you should understand what is this anti-nuclear antibody. Nowadays we do by indirect immunofluorescence on HEP2 cells. It has got a very high sensitivity, almost 98, 99%. If it is negative, it rules out the diagnosis of SLE. So they also, we also tell about the ANA patterns. It is homogeneous, speckle, nucleolar, peripheral, and centromere. And uh, this ANA pattern has got clinical associations. You can see in SLE, you can see any pattern of ANA and nuclear pattern is very importantly associated with scleroderma. There are various patterns and nowadays we don't give much importance in the, practic in the practical, in the real practice, we don't give much importance to the ANA patterns nowadays because we go by the pattern. So if the child has got dermatomyositis, you'll go by the other specific markers for dermatomyositis. If the child has got scleroderma, I will go and do SCL70 straight away than doing a But somebody, it can give us still give a clue towards what autoimmune disease usual association is. So when we examine this child, this child is febrile. It's got few cervical lymph nodes, no pallor, no extras, peripheral pulse are well felt, and systemic examination was also normal. So we did the investigations for this child. 20 days fever, no focus, nothing there on examination, but the white cell counts were low, platelets were normal, CRP is normal, ESR is just 42. And we also repeated the same um, infectious disease workup like blood culture, wheel filix, vidal, malaria, liver function test, blood culture, chest x-ray, which is also normal. So this child was also started on suprioxone and doxycycline. So, this child rheumatology consult was asked for, what do you do for this child? So because we don't have a straightforward diagnosis, so this child was asked for a bone marrow examination, macrophage activation syndrome workup, because this child has got prolonged fever and white cell counts are low, autoimmune workup, like SLE workup, and echo and bone scan. When we got the report, ANA was weak positive, anti-SM was awaited, DSDNA was negative, TB negative, HIV negative, bone marrow ruled out malignancy, ultrasound normal, bone scan normal, and other markers were 
for MAS were negative, like with ferritin, fibrinogen, and triglycerides. Because the fever is persisting, the antibiotics were Then we asked for, because fever is persisting, what will you do next for this child? CT thorax and abdomen was done. And if you looked into the CT thorax and abdomen, there are multiple mediastinal lymph nodes of <clears throat> significant mediastinal lymph nodes were present. So this child underwent lymph node biopsy. So lymph node biopsy, they say it is a necrotizing lymphadenitis on the right lymph node biopsy. So necrotizing lymphadenitis is something called Kikuchi's disease. So this child's anti-SM came as 24. So can we label her as SLE now? She has got 20 days of fever, girl, child, no other features of SLE, but ANA was weak positive, anti-SM was positive, and she has got Kikuchi's disease on the necrotizing lymphadenitis. So can you call her as SLE? So how do you diagnose somebody has got SLE? This is what we teach our postgraduates and medical students. We always teach them MD soap brain. This is the ACR 1997 revised classification criteria. Remember that classification criteria is for research purpose, not for diagnosis. Kawasaki disease is a diagnostic criteria. So she will not fulfill this criteria. So again, remember, as I said, you can diagnose lupus, but we cannot do for research purpose. And the latest 2012, we have a strict criteria has come. This has given a little more sensitivity and specificity than the ACR criteria. Here the, we have, they given a lot of importance to the cutaneous manifestations. Or, and they also talked about low complements there in the criteria. They looked into the antiphospholipid antibody also into the criteria, positive Coombs test also. So here are 11 criteria clinical and 11 and six criteria immunological criteria. So, to classify them, we need at least four and one should be clinical and immunologic. They also say somebody has got biopsy proven lupus with the ANA positivity, still they can diagnose as SLE. So what happened to the child? Very interestingly, after changing antibiotics, the fever settled, she was discharged. AVRs, we advised to follow this child four to six weeks with repeat CBC, ANA and SM. She came back, when you looked into the, she came back, she was a febrile and doing well, no fever at all. So if you look into the other autoantibodies in lupus, these are the other antibodies we do routinely when you diagnose lupus, DSDNA, SM, RNP, Rho, LA. So if you look into the antinuclear antibody, that's what the screening, negative test rules out the SLE. So if it is ANA is negative, we can 99%, we can surely say it can be not SLE. DSDNA, again, it is very important marker for correlation of the disease activity, especially when they have lupus nephritis. SM is very specific for SLE. No other disease will have SM antibody. And RNP is for MCTD and other overlap disease. Rho law is mainly for Sjogren syndrome or especially for pediatrics for neonatal lupus. Other antibodies, we do it based on the, if it is a drug-induced lupus, we do antihistone, antiphospholipid antibody, we do it for all the children with confirmed SLE. Okay, so what is the learning point? So don't make a diagnosis of SLE based on ANA alone. Do detailed workup when the clinical presentation is not classical. That's what very, very important. Don't, as soon as ANA only SM is positive, don't diagnose SLE. Don't do ANA panel or profile. Kindly do ANA by immunofluorescence, indirect immunofluorescence followed by the specific antibodies. Coming to the case three, there's a 14 years old girl from Calcutta. She presented with fever for 10 months duration. Pain and swelling over the, both the knees and small hands, arthritis I was there, was complained of pain over the right arm while writing and palpation and exertion and she has got headache. She was underwent extensive workup and finally she was diagnosed as systemic JA and started on naproxen and methotrexate, but fever was persisting, that's the reason she came here. When we saw this child has got arthritis, she has pale, and investigation slowed, some thrombocytosis was there, ESR, CRP was high, but all the other workup were negative. In the detailed examination, this child has got pallor and absent radial and brachial pulse. There is hypertension and there is a BP discrepancy to both the arms. So this child was considered of vasculitis, tracheoarthritis, MR angiogram was done. You can see this multiple narrowing. You can see at the level of subclavian, carotid arteries, uh, renal arteries, all were involved. So tracheoarthritis, prolonged fever, weight loss, 
arthritis can be that they can have systemic features. So when you look into the chapel hill classification in for children, in the large vessel, we have only tachyasso arthritis, no giant cell arthritis, in the medium vessel, polyarthritis, no doubt on KD. Small vessel vasculitis is usually present very acutely. They don't present like a prolonged fever, HSP, um, and hypochondromy atrical vasculitis and anca associated vasculitis. So learning point, any child with PUO, you check the blood pressure, feel the peripheral pulse, and remember that systemic arthritis is the diagnosis of exclusion. Please exclude infections, malignancy, and other rheumatological conditions, which can present like systemic JA. This is my last case. It's a three years old child, old girl. She presented the recurrent episodes of fever from the last one and a half years of age. Fever occurred once in a month, it lasts for two to three days, and it goes away without any other systemic features. And when we examined, she has got some macular rash with fever, no hepatospina megaly. And again, infectious workup, everything came as negative. And biopsy of that shows a trick area. And investigation revealed raised ESR, CRP, thrombocytosis, and leukocytosis. So can we consider periodic fever in this child? Yes. So these are the new group of disease. So when you suspect somebody comes with recurrent episodes of fever, and you ruled out all the infections. So this is what classically you see. Any autoimmune disease, your symptoms will be persisting all the time. But in the autoinflammatory disorders, there are symptoms, waxes and veins. So you suspect autoinflammatory or recurrent fever syndromes. If somebody has got characteristic rash, especially libido reticulosis, erysipelasis, pustulosis, serocytis, arthritis, mouth sores, oral ulcers, and laboratory evidence of inflammation, ESR, CRP, high. And there are a lot of autoinflammatory syndromes and periodic fever syndromes. The common ones are FMF, RAPS, HITS. Based on the duration of the attack, we can be able to uh, classify them clinically and based on the other associated distribution features. And there is a therapy for each and everything. So this is another group of CAPS, PFAFA, all the other things which can present with recurrent fever. More than prolonged fever, they all present with recurrent fever and skin lesions. And based on the clinical features, we can diagnose them by doing a genetic testing. So what is the prognosis? What is the prognosis of children with pediatric rheumatic diseases. This is a child with SLE. This child's mother has got SLE. This is a child after six months of treatment. This is a child when she became 18 years old. I <clears throat> transferred them to the adult rheumatology team. She's doing extremely very well. So this is another girl with the lupus. You can see this. This, is, this girl has got CNS lupus and class 4 lupus nephritis. She did, she's doing really very well. So this is one of my, one of our patients when I was working with Dr. Danda before my fellowship. This is one girl, she is around 14 years, she had lupus, class three, now she got married. Her first child she brought to show it to me. This is a second child, she is doing very well, having a normal life. And this is recently, about a month ago, she brought this boy, uh, the first child, with had some fever and upper respiratory infection. She came to see me doing very well. So the take home message, Rheumatological condition should be considered in any child who is presenting with pyrexia of unknown origin. Very important in pediatric rheumatology is the pattern recognition. So you follow the pattern. No investigation is always done to confirm your clinical diagnosis. So you order rheumatological investigations appropriately based on your clinical diagnosis on your pattern recognition and interpret the reports very judiciously based on this arthritis panel SLE panel, vasculitis panel doesn't work in pediatric rheumatology. And always remember, you call up your friend, your pediatric rheumatologist, if you have any doubt to them. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sutish. That was a wonderful talk on a difficult subject, difficult because uh, in the short time that is available, you have to uh, encapsulate all the common conditions that can present uh, with fever. Uh, there, have, there are several questions in the chat box. I'll summarize some of them. So what are the common rheumatological causes of uh, fever? So you have touched a few, but could you just enumerate them um, yes. Again, yeah. 
So it's just systemic. I told you five five causes, common causes. Kawasaki disease, SLE, systemic JA, vasculitis, and periodic fever syndromes, which we are now recognizing more and more. These are the more five commonest causes of uh, fever in a child when you, you have to suspect rheumatological disorders. So the most important thing is that when a pediatrician is dealing with a febrile child, you should resist the temptation to keep on changing antibiotics or rather using empirical antibiotics, one antibiotic after another. It happens all the time. And it happens in even the most developed countries. So uh, rheumatological causes of fever are real. You need a pediatric rheumatologist to assess the patient clinically. And this clinical assessment is, in fact, the most important part of the management of a child with fever. Because based on uh, this clinical assessment, you would either rule in or rule out a rheumatological uh, cause. One should resist the temptation of ordering a so-called rheumatology panel for fever. There is no such thing as a rheumatology panel for fever. You have to come to some kind of a clinical diagnosis and then try to uh, uh, arrive at a, a, a confirmed diagnosis and do only the most relevant investigation. It's very easy to order a whole panel of tests, but quite often that will leave you very confused uh, when the reports come in. So as Dr. Satish said, one of the common causes of prolonged fever is systemic GIA. Now, systemic GIA is a whole uh, chapter in itself, and it can fox even the most uh, experienced of rheumatologists. Uh, Dr. Satish, would you like to tell them um, how systemic GIA can be a diagnostic uh, conundrum? And how do you diagnose systemic GIA in absence of arthritis? Yeah, so that's really challenging. So remember that I said to show you some pictures, the fever, which is very, very important once a day or twice a day, and the child is well in between fever. That makes your biggest thing. Second thing, the rash. Classical rash comes along with fever and disappears when the fever goes away. And arthritis is there very easy. When the arthritis is not there, it's going to be difficult. Then we go by the investigations. If they have neutrophilic leukocytosis, thrombocytosis, anemia, that gives a clue. If somebody comes with only with fever and the rash is not very classical, if the counts are normal, always do a bone marrow and look for the other diagnosis before you label them as systemic JA. So systemic JA is a diagnosis of exclusion. And remember that they also can have serocytes, they can have hepatospinomegaly. So if you take, it can be DD for malignancy, it can be DD for TB. So if somebody has got classical fever, rash, neutrophilic leukocytosis, thrombocytosis, ESR CRP is very high. I am very comfortable making a diagnosis of systemic JA without doing a bone marrow. If you have any doubt, please do bone marrow. So, uh, uh, with children with systemic JIA reasonably confidently, but sometimes these children with systemic JIA can present with um, a life threatening complication known as macrophage activation syndrome. So what are the clues, clinical clues to macrophage activation syndrome? How soon do, you, do we need to act? And how do we act when you suspect macrophage activation syndrome? So if there are two things, one is if it's a known child with systemic JA coming with fever to near OPD. So this is already a child is on methotrexate. If the child comes to you with fever, if you see the normal counts, you should suspect macrophage activation syndrome more than is this disease flare. That's what we teach all our residents. And a systemic JA child comes with fever to the OPD, you think of three things. Infection, disease flare, macrophage activation syndrome. In the infection and the macrophage activation syndrome, we'll have normal counts or low counts. Platelets, again, can be low or normal. And the other important clue is CRP high, but ESR normal. ESR, the acute phase reactant in the ESR is fibrinogen. So when the ESR is low, always think of macrophage activation syndrome in a child with systemic JA. We are, the other part is sometimes systemic JA can present with macrophage activation syndrome. That is a real difficult to diagnose 
when somebody comes with fever arthritis hepatosplenoma kelly and pancytopenia that time you have to treat like macrophage activation syndrome sometimes the classical fever the classical rash comes after that so mas can present during the treatment of systemic ja or can present at the diagnosis thank you uh, as far as lupus is concerned which again uh, can present just with fever so how do you pick up lupus when the mala rash is clinically not very obvious the child is running fever you have ruled out the common causes of um, the infectious causes of fever so suppose the mala rash is not very prominent and you wish to rule out lupus clinically what do you do and what are the basic investigations that you would like to do okay so when you don't have the typical features of the garden variety of lupus so what we do is we look for we ask for the history again especially adolescent girls and secondary amenorrhea i told you the history is very very important in a child with lupus and we examine examine all the features for lupus like oral ulcers mala rash if it is nothing is there so a consult is sent to me from the general pediatric saying that kindly rule out lupus so what investigations we order is what usually i order is ana if there are no other features of lupus i order only ana i will do a urine routine i will do sometimes i'll ask for complements c3 and c4 Uh, that is made for mainly for my thing because in our hospital ana takes about 2 to 3 days to come go to the lab to do it c3 c4 comes within 4 hours in our lab so usually what my suggestion will be to do only ana if there are no other features of sle don't do ana panel you will stuck up with some other antibodies coming as positive and i do urine routine to look for protein i think this two should be your if there are no other features i think these two things are very very important for diagnosing of lupus thank you uh, there there are a few questions on rheumatic fever i think the most important is how long can the fever in rheumatic fever persist can it exceed 4 weeks 6 weeks so <laughs> rheumatic fever usually when the children coming with arthritis the fever is not a predominant symptom they have fever and throat pain 2 to 3 weeks earlier that's the time they usually have the very high grade fever and all so when you take it to po rheumatic fever is not a very big differential diagnosis when you see a child with po when you're talking about more than one day fever other manifestations are uh, not there i think rheumatic fever goes down again rheumatic fever you have a typical diagnostic criteria called jones criteria unless they fulfill jones criteria you should not diagnose rheumatic fever don't do aso unnecessarily if there is no rheumatic fever features like our carditis arthritis chindanam scoria erthima marginatum without that don't do aso unnecessarily in a child with po and make a diagnosis of rheumatic fever how frequently do you do procalcitonin when you are working up children with uh, unexplained fever okay so procalcitonin as you said that uh, you don't do routinely procalcitonin in a child with po sometimes in children with lupus when they come with fever we do procalcitonin and all those things so procalcitonin you know that it rises very fast it is if the child is sick in icu i think procalcitonin helps in the diagnosis of infection more than rheumatological conditions otherwise routinely for a po when you're a rheumatologist i don't ask for a procalcitonin okay uh, i would request my co-chair professor nazmu nahar uh, whether she would like to uh, ask some questions professor nazmu nahar okay nazmu nahar madam acha nahi okay uh, so thank you dr sathi i think we'll go I'm on to the sorry. second talk uh, this will this will be delivered by professor suma balan he is a professor and consultant pediatric rheumatologist at the department of rheumatology and clinical immunology amrita institute of medical sciences cochin and this is the second large pediatric rheumatology service that we have uh, in south india and professor suma balan has developed this service at at cochin 
um, over the last 15 years. She has been trained in the United Kingdom and I would now request her to speak on limping in children. And I think no other symptom in pediatric rheumatology tests the clinical skills of a rheumatologist as much as a limping child. Because other than the differential diagnosis, it is sometimes important not to over-investigate a limping child. So what investigations to do, how to do these investigations, and uh, how, how aggressively to do these investigations, that is where the skill of a pediatric rheumatologist uh, comes up. And I don't think we'd have uh, a more, uh, uh, an experience, more experienced uh, rheumatologist than Dr. Suma to, to tell us about approach to the limping child. Sir, Professor Nazmun Nar, Madam, is with us. Madam, do you like to uh, give your comments on our first presentation? Yes, yes, I want to comment. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay. Yes, ma'am, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I must congratulate my co-chair. And I'm really impressed with the uh, presentation of Dr. Satish. He has touched a very big and tough subject with a very efficient and uh, easy way. Because I'm not a rheumatologist. I'm a general pediatrician, but we know the pediatric uh, patient usually come to the general pediatrician first. Then they go to the specialist because we refer them to them. And PUO is, I throughout my life, I think this is the toughest subject in our practice because we become anxious, we become bothered, and the pa parents become very much anxious. They become angry with us. Why my baby is uh, getting fever uh, for a long time or recurrent fever? Why it is? And they changes from one doctor to another doctor. They are getting lots of uh, drugs. That is irrational use of drugs are uh, happening. So I, my conclusion is that, and I am also impressed with the lecture. That whenever our GP general pediatrician they must think of this when there is a long fever on uh, recurrent fever we can't get any uh, clinical clue or um, investigation is general investigations are not uh, satisfied us we must think of this the disease the common disease the common uh, features which are today uh, dr shatish has uh, told us because in our early life, we never think of Kawasaki's disease, but now we are getting a lots of Kawasaki disease here also. So because at that time in our mind, there was not, we, we stopped up to uh, J. And we never think of this disease. So now we have to think and we have to restrict our um, but I say the drug, especially the antibiotics, misuse of antibiotics, we should not give any fever, any PO, we must not give the antibiotic. We must, we have to uh, find out the cause because early treat, diagnosis and early treatment is very much required. So from uh, your lecture or your presentation, the recommendation you have done, the conclusion you have done is uh, we must take it carefully, and especially the general pediatrics. Thank you again, Dr. Shatish, for your beautiful presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Dr. Suma? Please unmute. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I really wish it could have been a physical meeting because I've always wanted to visit your country. Uh, thank you for the kind words, Dr. Surjit. And uh, I'll start off on the approach to the limping child. So, so I think um, it's very common for pediatricians to see children coming with musculoskeletal pains. It's one of the uh, one of the very common symptoms to which children present with. However, many of them may not really be much of a problem, but some of them we can pick out 
they may have serious systemic problems. They are a small, but a very systemic, very significant group. And I think we have to also realize that uh, what is managed by orthopedics and what is managed by rheumatology are fairly discrete areas. Now, the first important thing is not to confuse joint pain with arthritis. Uh, arthritis is objective diagnosis when somebody has pain. In addition to that, they have swelling, uh, synovitis, restriction, pain, tenderness with motion, warmth, redness, etc. Arthralgia is just pain in a, in a joint. And when we see a child presenting with a limp or with joint pain, what are the main skills one needs? And I think, look here, if you look at the list I've put here, the blood tests and all are not really coming in at present at all. So it's history and examination. That's the leading skills that we need. We need to be familiarized with the PGALS, the pediatric gait, arms, legs, spine kind of uh, examination. This is freely downloadable on YouTube. We need to ask questions like, how long is the problem been going for? Is it just one joint or is it multiple joints that are involved? Is there systemic involvement in addition to the joint symptoms? And are there red flag signs? And we need to be able to differentiate between pain or stiffness. What does a child have? To just touch on PGALS once more, these are very simple maneuvers that a physician can demonstrate and the child can imitate. Very easily done in your office. Absolutely no kind of uh, equipment is required. They're very evidence-based and these help you to facilitate which children may have a musculoskeletal problem and refer them on for further evaluation. There are some very common misconceptions. People believe that all children with JIA have fever. They believe that uh, all children with JIA have rashes. They believe that all children with joint pain must have JIA, that all arthritis is painful. That or if you have rheumatoid factor positivity, there must be an arthritis. If you have rheumatoid factor negative, negativity, they cannot have JIA. If x-rays are normal, there is no arthritis. Actually, none of these statements are correct. And I think hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be divested of many of these misconceptions if you already held them. So what is the challenge we face it's one thing to say history and examination, but really we need to know what we're looking for in this history and examination. We need to know how to tease out uh, joint findings by history and examination, very young children. Toddlers, for instance, will not come and tell you that they've got joint pain. They might actually just be irritable. They might resist certain movements. They may not cooperate for certain things. And uh, we need to understand that that is coming from a difficulty or stiffness of that particular joint or that limb. Similarly, uh, understanding that arthralgia and arthritis are not the same thing. So somebody with joint pain may have other reasons for it. They may not have arthritis at all. We need to be able to differentiate between stiffness, which is something that happens in inflamed joints and chronically inflamed joints like we see in JIA after a long period of rest. And that's why early morning stiffness is, uh, is typically a presence in these children. And this is more an inability to stretch the joint or to use that limb for a certain period of time. Gelling occurs and you know, the movement returns after some time. This is different from pain. And uh, stiffness is actually fairly suggestive of chronic inflammatory joint. Recognizing red flag signs, which I will show you in a minute, Recognizing synovitis. Now, it's, well, you might wonder why I said this. Say if you have synovitis of the wrist or the knee, it's very easy to pick. But if you have synovitis of deep joints like the shoulders and the hips, you actually need to examine for those joints, see the restrictions sometimes to be able to pick up the fact that those joints are inflamed. And then you have a whole number of patients who have only symptoms and no signs. Do we medicalize these patients or do we not? So what are the red flags? A very unwell child coming with a limp who has fever, weight loss, weakness, please take these children very seriously. They often need to be admitted and evaluated. And there are many causes for, for this uh, combination of symptoms. Bone pain or night pain, please literally uh, think of malignancy here. 
And there could be other causes too, which usually arises from a problem within the joint itself rather than from the, I mean, within the bone itself rather than from the joint. If they show regression of previously attained motor milestones with the limp, if they show significant functional disability, these are all things that we need to take quite seriously for different reasons. Now, I'll just show you a series of young children, all three-year-olds, all with a limp. And so this is a three-year-old boy in acute onset pain and right lower limb, he's uh, got a limp. He has no systemic features, no trauma. He's had a viral infection a week ago, and he has a limb, a limp and tenderness in his right hip. He's not particularly sick looking. If you look at his counts, they look perfectly normal. He has very minimal elevation of inflammatory markers. And this is the kind of child you can call to have a transient synovitis of the right hip, which pediatricians are very familiar with. And we know that this settles very fast. This is a three-year-old girl, high grade fever for four days, very toxic looking. She has a limp of the right lower limb and she's not actually bearing weight at all. She's got a pseudoparalytic posture. She's got a very tender right hip. She doesn't like being examined or handled. And if you look at her blood picture, it's quite different. She has neutrophilic leukocytosis, she has thrombocytosis, and she has raised inflammatory markers. She's febrile and toxic. This is a child I would consider septic arthritis and call the orthopedic surgeon because they need to wash out this limb and prevent the joint from being destructed and also early antibiotics after culture. Now, this is a three-year-old boy who has a high-grade fever with a limp over three weeks. So this is subacute. And he's progressively refusing to weight bear. He's very irritable. It's, again, red flag. Low-grade fever, not sleeping well at all. There's a red flag. Mild ankle swelling, so not that much in terms of findings, but refuses to be handled with, with that ankle. That's, again, a red flag. Look at his counts. Slight anemia. Total count is normal. The differential isn't normal. This is neutropenic with a relative lymphocytosis and he has low normal platelets, which again should raise a question in your head. And he has slightly elevated inflammatory markers. He has a raised LDH, which sometimes suggests a, uh, increased marrow turnover and his peripheral smear is normal. I would not be reassured by this peripheral smear. This boy has a number of red flags in his story and I would go ahead and do a bone marrow and his diagnosis was ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The majority of children with leukemia, especially acute lymphoblastic leukemia, present with low count, low peripheral blast count disease. And we have to really go by the history, have a strong suspicion and make the diagnosis. Here is a three-year-old girl with a nine-month history of a progressing limp, nine-month history pronounced on waking up from sleep. She refuses to walk on waking. She's not complaining of a limp. The parents have observed the limp, but she refuses to walk on waking. She has no fever. She's better by mid-morning, but she has progressive swelling of the right knee. And you can see there is clear-cut synovitis and a fixed flexion deformity. Again, look at her counts. It's very similar to the previous child's counts, except that the differential count is normal. There is thrombocytosis and the same very mild elevated inflammatory markers. This is your child with oligoarticular JIA. And a three-year-old boy, this is very interesting, six months history of bilateral knee pain. Progressively, he's refusing to bear weight. He has mild fullness of his joints, very mild, not much in the way of examination, but will not allow you to touch his knees. He's systemically well. His knees uh, are always kept in the resting position. And again, his counts are quite normal. His inflammatory markers are not very significantly elevated. He has a normal peripheral smear. You might wonder, I mean, uh, he has had many tests done. In fact, uh, when he came to us, he was referred actually as a polyarthritis when he came to us. Um, but the other story that came through is a very, very fastidious diet. And we actually made a diagnosis of scurvy in this child. He had, and you can see this was his knee x-ray. You can see the various, the osteopenia, metaphysial rarefaction, the pencil thin cortex, the Wimberger sign, and the white line. And after treatment with, um, with a little bit of naproxen and mostly vitamin C, you can see the huge difference and the boy started bearing weight. His pain disappeared in two days of starting vitamin C. And you know, things is a very happy story at the end of the day. 
This is the child who presented with the leukemia. And you can see this metaphyseal leucine zones, both in the tibia and the fibula. And this is a very subtle sign on x-ray that can lead you to suspect. Again, as I said, it's always about history and examination. A 13-year-old girl, eight months history of right lower limb pain, particularly at night. She was okay at, in, the, in the daytime. Her examination was completely normal as were well her counts. And her x-ray was normal. But this history, you cannot ignore this night pain history. So we did an MRI on her which showed with the CT correlation, which showed that she has a right side of trochanteric osteoid osteoma and she was treated with RFA and completely cured. So here are many other children who come with limp. So here is a child with um, right knee uh, swelling who was referred as an oligoarticular JIA. You can actually see that he even underwent a synovial biopsy before coming to us, which just showed some chronic inflammation. But interestingly here, what, it, what can you see? The swelling is actually you know, just outside the joint. It's a soft tissue swelling. And when we did an ultrasound, there was uh, possibly pus accumulation. We uh, did uh, we did a IND of this lesion and he turned out to have atypical mycobacteria. And this was actually infections uh, secondary to that. So this was not, an uh, not a JIA. See, this child might present to you with a limp. What he has is a linear scleroderma, quite old lesion. And you can see it's crossing the joint. It can produce a mild flexion deformity. It can also produce reduced growth of that limb. And this is another reason that can that another child who can present with a limb and limb length discrepancy because of this condition. This child can come to you with an acute arthritis. He has ankle swelling, but he also has foot swelling. He has a cutaneous vasculitis. And he has the same thing on his hands. Uh, so this is a HSP, acute HSP. They can come to you with acute painful arthritis. And this boy, he looks like an oligo JIA, doesn't he? Long, long standing the swelling of his right knee with, you can see poor growth of his muscles, a very difficult weight bearing. And, um, you know, one would think he's a JIA. But when we did this x-ray, he has actually uh, increased bone growth on in his knee. And looking at all the other findings, this was actually a rare condition, an auto-inflammatory disorder called an, a NOMID or an NLRP3 mutation, which we've proven genetic, genetically. And so there are many things. It's ultimate. There are so many conditions to think of, but it's your history examination that really helps you to narrow down what the possibilities could be. Another a young lady, she came to me with recurrent knee swelling, was being managed as a JIA. So we thought we would inject her joint, but when we injected, what we noticed was we got blood-stained uh, joint fluid. So chronic um, arthritis with blood-stained joint fluid is not likely to be JIA. We did an MRI, it was a synovial hemangioma, and she got sclerotherapy done with good results. So there are so many causes, but you know it's down to history examination and then the next step, what is the most logical thing to do? This is again a very common scenario, eight-year-old child, occasional non-specific joint pain, completely normal examination. Two years back, however, she had a febrile sore throat with an ASO of 1800, and they have been regularly checking her ASO over the last two years, every month or so, and it's never apparently came down. So she was diagnosed as rheumatic fever and started on injection penidure. Do we really think this is logical? She has never had rheumatic fever. All she had was a sore throat due to beta hemolytic strep. And uh, she has never really had the clinical scenario of a rheumatic fever. A high ASO, like Dr. Satish said earlier, is not suggestive of rheumatic fever. The incidence of acute rheumatic fever in India is hugely reduced. We still see very occasional cases, but nothing like when I was doing my MD, the, the large number of cases that we used to see. And it's really, again, a clinical diagnosis. You have the Jones criteria to, make you, to help you make the diagnosis. The diagnosis is not made based on an ASO criteria. It's made based on Jones criteria. And ASO is just one of the supportive criteria in, in that list. Remember, rheumatic fever never results in permanent joint deformities. And it is apart from the cardiac issues can be, but the musculoskeletal part of rheumatic fever is never chronic. 
and elevated ASO titers suggest only one thing that there was a past uh, infection with beta hemolytic streptococcus. Nothing other than that. And it should never be that elevated ASO titers should lead you to start Penidior for a child long term. Another thing that pediatricians tend to see very commonly growing pains. I think lots of this happens. I know um, many of my friends or children who've had this, and these are actually non-inflammatory pain syndrome, usually in children between three to 12 years of age. There's a variable intensity and duration, and it's usually non-articular pain. It's above and below the joint most of the time, and usually nocturnal at the time of going to sleep or shortly after going to sleep. Very rarely do they actually wake up in the middle of the night, several hours after going to sleep. And it resolves very easily with just a bit of uh, TLC actually, just tender loving care most of the time. And uh, there are no systemic symptoms, no signs, no other issues. Just be careful when you take a history that you're not missing out bone pain. That's the only thing. It's quite easy to distinguish and usually resolves spontaneously, doesn't need much in the way of treatment. This young lady came to me with a diagnosis of JIA. She was already on methotrexate, and the story was that she has a lot of joint pains, particularly triggered by exercise. She was learning dance, and every time she practices for a function, she would end up with a lot of joint pains. And if you examine her, what is the story here is she has significantly hypermobile joints, and we actually have a clinical score called the Baton score to determine this particular condition, this particular diagnosis. And it's very easy if you uh, do these maneuvers, very easy to make a diagnosis. It's also very important that we can give this diagnosis to the children. They don't need a lot of medication. They don't need a lot, uh, you know, a lot of uh, treatment and uh, they just need to have adequate physio warm up and a lot of reassurance and they often grow out of it. And this is something that we simply cannot ignore. I see a lot of this, um, especially in COVID times where children not going to school, missing out on friends, missing out their regular routines. We see a lot of this actually. So children who present with lots and lots of symptoms. They do present, you know, abdominal pain to gastroenterologist, headache to neurologist, every kind of ache to the pediatrician. And uh, they, but what is common to them is that they have symptoms out of proportion to signs. Sometimes they have allodynia, which is a kind of a completely disproportionate level of um, uh, response, pain response to a very, very simple um, maneuver that or examination you might do. They have bizarre symptomatology that doesn't add up to any particular pattern. Usually there would be a loss of school attendance. There would be a secondary gain due to altered family dynamics. There could be learning difficulties. There could be primary mental health issues. And it's very, very important. Many of these children with chronic pain syndromes are crying for help. The problem is not an organic medical problem. It could be a functional med uh, problem, but we need to discover it. We need to get them the right help that they need. And the challenge is often convincing the, fa the family and also not medicalizing these patients. The worst thing you can do to a child with chronic pain is to put them in a cast, is to tell them to take bed rest that actually makes the problem worse and try to convince the family to get psychological input. Now, a few other things I wanted to underline. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which is one of the commonest conditions we see as pediatric rheumatologists, it's called juvenile idiopathic arthritis and not juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. I think we should all stop using that term, uh, mainly because the term is misleading. It makes you think that this is a uh, childhood version of adult RA, which it isn't. JIA is a commonest rheumatic disease of childhood. The prevalence is about one in a thousand. It's a heterogeneous disease, unlike RA, which is homogeneous. And only 5% is rheumatoid factor positive. And it's very important that we uh, understand, we recognize and diagnose these patients and start them early on treatment to prevent long-term problems. Now, here are the criteria for the uh, classification or for the diagnosis of JIA. The important thing to note in this list is that there is not a single blood test. 
it is very much a clinical diagnosis. So once we have made a clinical diagnosis, possibility of JIA, the next thing we do is we look at the pattern and number of joints involved. We looked at the clinical involvement and then decide what subgroup they could belong to. And remember that before we make a diagnosis of JIA, there are many, uh, this is a very not, not at all exhaustive list, but there are many differential diagnoses that we need to think about. And so we, again, it's very important that we look at the history and examination and the common blood test that we do before we decide that we are dealing with JIA because JIA has the word idiopathic in it. Similarly, even for polyarthritis, there's a very wide differential diagnosis. And we need to, again, do a detailed clinical assessment before we come to the conclusion that we are dealing with a polyarticular JIA. There are some interesting uh, findings that I could show you. What is demonstrated here is, you can see, uh, Achilles tendon enthesitis. You can see that in both these pictures, this child has ERAJIA. This enthesitis is a, can be a feature of ERAJIA, enthesitis related arthritis JIA, and or psoriatic JIA or IBD associated arthritis. In this child, it was enthesitis related arthritis. In this child, you can see there is also ankle joint swelling in addition to the enthesitis, and these are twins. The sister is clearly dis displaying a psoriatic patch here. And this child has also got a psoriatic patch where a, probably a skin biopsy has been done. So there are two types of JIA, both associated with enthesitis in the same uh, slide that you can see. And these children, some of these children can progress to what we know in adults as ankylosing spondylitis. And this is where the test HLA-B27 helps us. Now, usually they start with enthesitis, lower limb arthritis, and then axial arthritis. And the important thing about finding out these patients is it's only in this group of patients in whom a HLA-B27 is a useful test. I will not repeat this. Dr. Satish has already been through. He showed us cotidian fever and the rash of um, systemic onset JIA. This is a child with polyarthritis. And this is a toddler. This toddler was referred to a geneticist actually as a spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. But actually, there was a clear history of morning stiffness. Not that they didn't give it as morning stiffness, but they said this child is impossible in the morning. She's very irritable, very uncooperative, and she's such a bad temper. And uh, when you examine her, you see she has restrictions of her wrist. She has multiple small joint, PIP joint involvement, and she has cervical spine restriction. This is polyarticular disease. This is how we examine little children. So I'll do very little on the management aspects. So investigations, history, and examination for 90% of your diagnosis. Beyond that, you are actually looking to further ratify your diagnosis and making sure you ruled out other conditions. A count is a very, very important test. And the first test we do in all these patients, uh, patients with inflammation will show you anemia, leukocytosis, and thrombocytosis. However, if your patient has anemia, leukopenia, and low platelets in the history of a joint pain, be very careful. You could be dealing with a malignancy. You could be dealing with SLE. You could be dealing with systemic JIA and a macrophage activation syndrome. If you're dealing with, uh, you could also have normal counts in children with JIA. That should not put you off the diagnosis. Again, inflammatory markers can be raised or normal. And there can be certain variation, interesting variations like a high CRP and a low ESR in a child with macrophage activation, a low, um, a low, uh, I mean, a low CRP and a high ESR in a child presenting with SLE. Now, the specific investigations, just like uh, Satish said before, I want to reiterate that we do not do blood tests on every child before we make a diagnosis of JIA. We have usually made a diagnosis that this child has JIA, and then we choose the best possible test for these children. You will find that in most of our pediatric rheumatology OPDs, ASO titer is very rarely requested. Rheumatoid factor, we do 
in specifically in children with older children with a rheumatoid factor, uh, rheumatoid arthritis like presentation who had symmetrical polyarthritis in older children. Anti CCP is rarely done in a pediatric rheumatology or patients again. ANA positivity we do particularly in young children presenting with uh, JIA or in adolescents where we might also suspect that this could be lupus. And the importance of an ANA positivity in young children presenting with JIA is that there is an increased risk for uveitis in these patients. And HLA-B27, I already told you, we do it in the set scenario of an enthesitis-related arthritis or um, you know, the other differentials there. None of these investigations are diagnostic of this particular condition. They only help towards further prognostication. Uh, radiology, again, is helpful, but we need to know how to use it and when to use it. X-rays, we rarely do X-rays unless we, are, uh, we want to rule out something else or we think that there could be a, a, a specific reason for doing one. Ultrasound is very helpful in our uh, practice. It can pick up synovitis. It can guide us with intraarticular injections. MRIs we use particularly in children with sacroiliitis because it is very difficult in uh, pediatrics uh, prior to you know, um, epiphyseal closure to be able to view it on x-rays. And um, synovial biopsies we rarely do. Synovial fluid examinations also we rarely do. JIA is a clinical diagnosis. Very rarely, sometimes we do invasive tests to rule out other differentials. And there is a general trend. I have nothing against orthopedic surgeons. I make a disclaimer. In fact, I'm married to one. But um, uh, I would like to say that we need to have a paradigm shift in our attitude to joint pain in children. And we need to realize that there is a small group of conditions which involve infection, injury, and osteochondrosis where our orthopedic colleagues are extremely helpful. But if we are seeing somebody with more than one joint involvement, it's far more likely to be a medical problem. If you're seeing a chronic joint involvement, again, it is far more likely to be a medical problem and probably it's a rheumatologist that you need. And also remember that bony malignancy or leukemias is something that as pediatricians, we should be making a diagnosis ourselves. Now, why is it so important to diagnose JIA and to refer them for appropriate therapy? There can be so much of uh, complications if you don't do so. Look at this girl with a limb length discrepancy and an apparent scoliosis due to a very long uh, lower limb. You can see the chronic monoarthritis from JIA that she has. And this young lady has had a chronic polyarthritis with uh, P a PNJ involvement and a receding chin. This young lady has had missed uveitis and you know, and which can actually blind children if it's not picked up early. All children, younger children with both oligo and polyarticular disease should undergo regular eye checkups to look, slip plant examinations to look for uveitis. Untreated or undertreated polyarthritis can leave you in a wheelchair with many damaged joints. And this boy was 13 years old. In addition to deformities, he also has growth retardation due to both untreated long-term systemic JIA and long-term steroid intake. So there are many reasons why we should actually be thinking about these conditions and referring these patients appropriately early. So the learning points we have, we need to make the right diagnosis. There are many differentials and it's a history and examination that gives us the pointers. Early diagnosis and referral is important. We are pitted against patients who go for doctor shopping uh, because overall, the uh, you know, it's not just the medical community, even in the gentle community, the knowledge of JIA itself is very poor. We should abstain from giving penidior just because ASO titer is elevated, ATT for a chronically single swollen joint without actually proving that it's due to tuberculosis, we should uh, make sure we don't miss bone pain and malignancy. And please remember that JIA is not uh, diagnosed based on blood tests, 
but based on history and examination. And inflammation times time leads to disability. That's the reminder I leave you with. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Soma. So I think Dr. Soma has made some very important points. We must remember that juvenile idiopathic arthritis is one of the very common causes of childhood morbidity. In fact, if you ask for three common causes of morbidity in children, it is bronchial asthma, which affects something like 10 to 12% of the pediatric age group, epilepsy, and third will be juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It is so common, but quite often this will be misdiagnosed or not diagnosed and treated inappropriately. The other important point which Dr. Suma made was, when you are dealing with a child who has a joint issue, a joint problem, the first port of call has to be with the pediatrician, not with the orthopedic surgeon. And again, it happens all the time that whenever uh, a child, a mother notices that a child has a joint problem, I think the first consultant that she calls is the orthopedic surgeon. And they are not trained to look at children, especially young children. And, and their approach to a child uh, with a joint problem will be very different from uh, a rheumatologist approach. The morbidity associated with JIA can be uh, uh, very, very significant. We have scores of children who have virtually blinding uveitis associated with JIA. And this uveitis associated with JIA is often asymptomatic. So the child develops um, uveitis without any symptoms. And by the time the parents notice that there is decreased visual equity, it may be too late. Uh, so these are some of the important points which, which Dr. Suma had made. Uh, Dr. Suma, would you like to mention in your experience, how often have you seen tuberculosis uh, being overdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, and what are the common presentations of TB? Um, and in a year's time, how many children with TB arthritis of various kinds would you see at your center? I would possibly see maybe a couple of uh, two to three maybe of TB or TB-related arthritis in a year. The commonest uh, presentation I see with TB is actually a, uh, probably a lymph node TB with a reactive arthritis or what we call a Ponset disease. And that's and one of the important things is that every child who comes to us with a possible diagnosis of JIA, we do a full detailed examination, including looking at their lymph nodes, examining for lymphadenopathy. And uh, we, you know, the, most of these patients are actually they present with an oligoarticular presentation and they will have slightly elevated inflammatory markers. In fact, I've even seen a child with a nine month history of bilateral elbow arthritis with uh, uveitis and with uh, quite large lymph nodes, who I thought is probably sarcoidosis, but we did the lymph node biopsy. He had a blistering mantle and a uh, lymph node biopsy was suggestive of tuberculosis and he recovered beautifully with treatment. So that is one thing we can see. Um, we can also see joint uh, primary and you know um, uh, joint or bone related TB osteoarticular TB in children and again that is based on the symptoms and the findings you have and I think you know it's TB is not going to be asymptomatic in a child there will be fairly significant symptoms the primary osteoarticular TB usually will have systemic symptoms as well, which we cannot miss. So it is, it is something that is always in the back of our mind. I routinely do montos in all my patients when I make a diagnosis and prior to starting treatment, we do a chest x-ray screening as well for many patients, especially if we have a suspicion. But um, 
the children, particularly with the oligoarticular presentation, it is one of the things to keep in mind that this could be a, a TB-related arthritis. However, we should also remember it is a, often a posse articular TB. So if we, even if we do uh, you know, uh, aspiration from the joint, look for AFD, we may not actually find much in the smear. We may get it on gene expert or on culture, but we may not find much from the smear. And if you do a synovial biopsy from these patients, they have a strong clinical suspicion. If you do a synovial biopsy, it's very important that you send a piece in saline for culture and also for the gene expert estimation because just the histopathology enough alone may not be enough to make the diagnosis. We would not do a signable biopsy in every child with an oligoarthritis to rule out tuberculosis prior to treatment. So I think uh, our experience would be similar. Over the last maybe 25 years, I don't think we would have diagnosed more than one to two cases of TB arthritis ever in a year. So the ratio of JIA to TB arthritis would be something like 100 is to 1. So, so one should resist the temptation of empirical use of anti-tubercular therapy when you are dealing with chronic arthritis. Dr. Suma, would you like to uh, emphasize what um, uh, uh, is can viral? Can I comment here? Wise? Dr. Singh, can I comment here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, please. You know, in our, in my early a stage when I was a student, that is in the 70s, 80s, then we got a lot of TB arthritis at that time, we used to see, but now it is very rare. But at that time, we had no gene expert uh, facilities. So we used to do, depend on the clinical findings, the history, history of contact, and we usually do the synovial biopsy. And by that, we used to treat those patients. So it is now rare, but I, I'm in the 70s, 80s year, we have run across a loss of patients, lot, not loss, but number of patients with TB arthritis. But now with the treatment and everything, with the awareness, I think it is rare. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, what about toxic synovitis or viral synovitis? How many patients do you see? How do you diagnose them? Are they liable to be misdiagnosed? I, I don't think many of them come to me. I think they're probably managed uh, locally by pediatricians and their uh, local support orthopedic surgeons themselves. Uh, I don't tend to see, I don't see many of these patients actually referred to me as such. It does happen. It uh, settles. It's not like as common as you would think it is but it does happen and it settles quite easily with uh, simple analgesia. I think one, one case I remember very vividly, this was from my time in the UK, a child who was presenting with recurrent toxic synovitis. It was being termed as toxic synovitis each time. This, and one thing that was uh, outstanding was that she had a low HP and each time she was coming, her, her HP was lower than the previous time. So at the third time when she came, I think the uh, antenna really went up and then we investigated her more and she actually had a neuroblastoma. So if you have, you know, a recurrent toxic synovitis, it should raise a red flag. And at the same time, it, it is uh, probably fairly common. I think pediatricians generally, generally pick up and manage it themselves. It's fairly acute. I don't tend to see too much of it in my practice. Thank you. So... Uh, this usually occurs in uh, younger children and the child does not look ill and uh, fever may be mild or, you know, on the uh, way down. Usually not difficult to pick up clinically, but sometimes can be confused with uh, septic arthritis. But if you give analgesic, uh, it generally resolves within uh, two to three days uh, and, and uh, uh, not very difficult to pick up. Just a word about um, sickle disease arthritis. We don't see sickle disease at all in North India, but do you see that? Uh, and is it a diagnostic problem the first time when it appears? I, I haven't actually had too much experience with it myself. We have only one belt of sickle cell anemia in Kerala, in the Palakkad area. 
and I think uh, I have not had too much experience with uh, uh, sickle cell disease myself from my point of view, but it can be. I think bone pain, it would be actually severe price, would be very, very painful disease. More than arthritis itself, it would be the bone pain and the bone crisis that probably present. We have um, a very, very you know, supportive hematology department. I think they manage more most of the time. I haven't got to see much of it. Dr. Satish, would you like to uh, say something about yeah. sickle crisis? Yeah. So sickle crisis usually causes dactylitis, severe painful. Uh, I not see, I just not come to my rheumatology OPD. I never seen anybody. You know, the rheumatologist may be seeing, but I have not seen. Okay. Uh, I think we have crossed our time. I, I thank both the speakers and I would request my co-chair, Professor Nazmul sir, Nahar. Sir, uh, sir, before ending our session, we have a very special uh, guest mm. with us, President Aplar, Professor Devashish Danda. Uh, we like to hear uh, something from him as he's very mm. close to our group, BD Physicians. After hearing from uh, Professor uh, Devashish Danda, then our uh, Chairperson Professor Nazmul Nahar, Madam, will conclude the session. Uh, Professor Devashish Danda, first of all, congratulations. And sir, please, we like to hear something from him. Thank you very much. I have nothing more to say. I am just delighted that we had today uh, three very eminent uh, pediatric rheumatologists from our country uh, had spoken to BD physicians. And um, I mean, it's, it's a, a pleasure to be associated with all of them in many ways. Uh, Professor Sujit is, is, he has almost built the Mecca of pediatric rheumatology in whole of South Asia, I would say, and wonderful center with both in teaching and research. So we are very fortunate that he again agreed to join your meeting. Uh, Dr. Satish Kumar is uh, very close to me as he has mentioned that I was running the pediatric rheumatology clinic. And when Dr. Satish approached the uh, administration to be trained in pediatric rheumatology, the administration had asked me uh, to overlap him and sort of mentor him. And before he went to Canada for three years, we had overlapping clinic and I was holding on the pediatric rheumatology clinic till Satish came back. So, and Satish is an excellent human being. We are good friends and not just teacher students. And Dr. Suma is an excellent uh, rheumatologist. She's a prolific writer, if some of, you, some of you don't know. She's a good writer and she writes in multiple issues in social media. She's a brilliant uh, academician. And interestingly, Dr. Suma and me had done medicine from the same medical school, Jipmar Pondicherry. And uh, I had worked for a year as a demonstrator in physiology in Jipmar. And Dr. Suma had joined MBBS in Jipmar first year. So the physiology uh, demonstrators is to take uh, practical uh, uh, classes for physiology students. And it, it was the first time I met her there. And after that, we have been colleagues uh, and we interact with on many uh, various other issues. Dr. Suma is a, uh, is a multifaceted talent and you heard how beautifully she spoke. I'm very happy that the Bangladesh and India have been uh, collaborating so well uh, uh, and BD physician under the leadership of Dr. Hassan has been doing so many programs. I do not know of any other forum who has program almost every uh, day almost they have something or other. And uh, I'm really proud to be associated with all of you. And as I mentioned earlier, my roots are from Bangladesh. My grandparents had migrated from there in 1949. And Dr. Surjit has a special connection also. Dr. Surjit's father had served the Indian Army uh, and was involved in Bangladesh's freedom movement. So that was very really nice to have some or other connection. So today's session by Surjit, uh, Satish and Suma, I would call it triple S, or it's one of the triple S uh, is an interesting word in India. We have uh, 
in sanskrit you know one way of describing divine god as satyam shivam and sundaram satyam is truth and shivam is the name of god you call it by any name and sundaram is beauty so i think today it was a uh, excellent uh, satyam shivam sundaram session of pediatric rheumatology i take the pride uh, that i could um, be involved in some way or other with the physicians thank you for inviting me to thank you sir thank you for having us thank you very much thank you uh, now i am offering our today's chairperson uh, uh, professor nazmun nahar madam uh, to conclude the session before the ending i must thanks uh, give thanks to professor surjit singh for his wonderful presence and our both the speaker especially dr shotish kumar sir is uh, till now busy with answering the questions was there are so many questions i think uh, more than 100 of questions but sir is uh, answering the questions very passionately uh, thank you all now i am offering professor nazmun nahar madam uh, to conclude the session thank you asan really i am very proud and honored today being a general pediatrician you have included me in this session and with this big big bosses and the big giant on rheumatology i must congratulate both of the speaker for the beautiful presentation and also my co-chair who is a very good what i say moderator or as a chair person the round up uh, program i i must congratulate dr soma you know in our children practice limping is caused by is a, presented the children with a mild or sep we think this is self limiting that is it may be due to contusion due to strain or sprain these are the mild thing so we don't bother with those people but we have to follow up because some can be a sign of severe or even life threatening condition so delays in diagnosis and treatment can result in significant morbidity and persistent limp cannot be ignored so we must point out we must be careful being the general pediatrician the persisting limp we have to investigate we have to find we have to observe the baby because most of them maybe uh, most of them are treatable incurable so my thanks to soma for his presentation because i am you know updated with both the lecture by dr professor shatish and professor soma i am really grateful to the organizer for asking me to chair this session and for updating me with this knowledgeable lecture thank to my chair person and also thanks to the speaker and i also thanks the organizer especially asan for asking me to attend this session thank you all onik uh, 